just quickly, I would like to, to thank uh, the organizer of the event and the, and the host for really, really uh, uh, an amazing uh, time uh, here. It's been really quite, uh, quite impressive to see all the presentations so, so far. So thank you very much uh, to them. Um, so, I'm going to try to do it quite, uh, quite quickly because you've been going through a lot of presentation this morning. So now we're going to basically zoom inside these evil uh, fences uh, that are the schools. Now, uh, before talking about um, the kind of work that we're doing at uh, the Pittsburgh Institute and the Willem de Koning Academy, I just want to make a quick a quick uh, overview of um, this problematic world that is open source. So very quickly, um, 1986, you have Richard Stallman, who is basically doing his Stallman thing in his lab. And they get, the legend says that they get a new printer, and then the printer, the driver, he wants to hack the driver to do something, but that he cannot uh, do it, so he gets very, very upset, and uh, then of that, uh, the rest is history, is the foundation, the creation of the Free Software Foundation and the GPL license. So in 91, uh, Linus Torvald uh, think it's a quite interesting project, so he decides to use this, uh, this license for the Linux kernel, and then we know what happens next. 98, uh, uh, someone else that is a bit in the, in the dark, which is uh, Eric Raymond, has write a book that tried to, to explain the ecosystem of, uh, of free software production. And this is quite inspiring for Netscape, uh, who think that this could be uh, some sort of exit strategy for their, their browser. And Raymond looking at how Netscape is using open source you know, commercial practices, well, free software and commercial practices, decides with a few other people to uh, not fork, but kind of uh, branch the free software movement into the open source uh, uh, initiative. And open source, the intention, of course, was to, to be attractive, more attractive to, uh, to business people, but at the same time to clarify this sort of, of confusion around uh, the problematic world that, such as free and, and freedom. And um, the consequence of that is that suddenly this, this project and this intention, this way of working, becomes more attractive to other fields. So in 99, you have, for instance, the first uh, example of first steps towards uh, a clearer articulation of open source uh, hardware with the early uh, open source um, uh, core uh, CC, uh, CC CPU project. Uh, 99, you also have um, something that starts to be uh, a more diffusion into other cultural uh, fields, such as the architecture. So the, in 99 already, people are starting to talk about open source architecture. And then, Beyond, uh, beyond that, uh, in 2001, you have Lawrence Lessig, who also gets very, very upset, like, uh, like, like Stallman, because he's looking at the internet and he's seeing this sort of, uh, what, he, what he kind of called this sort of Sovietization, potential Sovietization of the network. His fear is the media industry will start to lock down uh, the, the resources and the way people are sharing online. And he thinks his mission is to, to provide a constitution for the cyberspace, and this is done through the project Creative Commons. At the same time, uh, Wikipedia is, 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 get, is coming in, and they, source a free, they choose a free software uh, license for their project. Later on, they will switch to a Creative Commons license. And 2001 is also the project Free Beer because these things are getting more and more popular. So artists think to say, oh, it's quite funny, this open source stuff. So they make a Free Beer project to try to communicate on this issue. And it's also the birth of the free art uh, license. And then things are getting even more and even more confusing with 2003, the birth of the open source yoga movement. So the open source yoga movement is basically a response towards an attempt from some yogi in the USA to patent some asanas, or so some yoga positions, and to trademark them. And this is interesting because this, uh, this movement is trying to make a link between open source and public domain, which is not quite exactly this, but this is a very... Uh, good case of interpretation of open source in a, in a broad mainstream context. Uh, but this even goes further with uh, 2003, the birth of uh, open source Judaism that was um, hinted by Douglas Rushkoff in the conferences to, to try to, to explain what, how uh, religions could benefit from open source. Um, but it's also uh, the, the birth of the open educational resources, which is a sort of collection of uh, documents that uh, universities and academy try to share and put online so other people can, can reuse their course curriculum. 2004, open government, same stories. So we want to, we're interested in two open source, but we understand it through the transparency approach. So we think that it could be good for government. Uh, and 2005, Adrian Boy is um, challenging the economy by trying to create uh, 
basically some sort of physical fork bomb by, by creating a machine that, that would eventually print, uh, print itself, which is the RepRap project. Uh, it starts to get quite messy, so a few people start to get together and, to, and try to, to understand how this whole open source uh, system is, uh, is working, which is quite difficult. So 2006 is the Open Knowledge Foundation is, um, is created to try to, to clarify some of these definitions and some of these licenses in a, in a more broader cultural context. It's also the similar project is the Freedom Defined project that attempts to, to clarify what is really free in Creative Commons licenses and other uh, free and open source licenses or permissive licenses. And 2006, of course, is the, also the first LGM event. In 2007, you have the Open Handset Alliance, which is Google's own approach to, to open source. It's a kind of second um, approach towards how to integrate uh, open source in a, in a, in a, in a commercial, commercial context. 2010, you have open source fashion, but you also have open source jihad, which is uh, a kind of uh, um, um, a sort of sub branch of Al Qaeda, who basically try to, uh, to have been trying to rebrand uh, the anarchist cookbook under this uh, open source jihad that that is found in several um, underground uh, fanzine. Uh, it's also the, the the birth of the open web, which tried to borrow some of the openness of the open source mess into, uh, into, 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 the, into the internet through the promotion of open, um, open standards. Uh, 2012, it's also now the, 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 the creation of the Open Data Institute in London. So now we're moving into, again, further away from the original free software and open source um, intent towards more, okay, how, do we, how should we lend sense and how should we access large data sets? Uh, it's also the year where Defense Distributed is created. So um, basically with the combination of open source technology and 3D printing, what uh, some people are interested in printing their own, uh, their own firearms. And uh, it's also how they got kicked out from Thingiverse and then created the DevCAD, uh, DevCAD project. And now finally, 2013, the Willem de Koning Academy decides to do something about open source. So, uh, looking quickly at all this history, we can be a bit worried, because how now do artists and designers within a context of education are going to interpret these, these questions? Uh, what kind of new things are they going to, uh, to invent to, to again uh, reclaim the word open source one more time? Well, as it's goes, uh, this particular uh, project concerns the, the bachelors. But in the true spirit of uh, open source, we're not going to start from scratch. And in that sense, we have a very good code base to start working with, which is the Pittsburgh Institute. So the Pittsburgh Institute is the master program of uh, the Willem de Koning Academy, and it happens that uh, we've been quite interested in the question of free software and free culture for quite, quite some time um, already. More particularly, um, the way the course is, is, uh, is articulated is done through wiki, free, lib, and open source software, a uh, quite important aspect to, to given to research, and generally, uh, do it yourself, do it with other uh, ethos. So the wiki. Uh, the wiki basically is, is quite central to the, to the course. This is where we put all the thing, it's not so much, it's, it's barely no, no moderation on the wiki, which happens that sometimes you have some wiki wars going on between the students, it's quite, it's quite nice. Um, and we put everything on the, on the wiki, it's not a secret wiki, it's public, you can go there, you can even create a, an account. The, the presence of free, of free software is, uh, is for the network media branch of the Media Design Master is very important as we start usually right away, almost right away, with uh, an install party, which allows right uh, since the beginning to try to give the students some sort of mapping of what is free culture by understanding the relationship between Debian, Ubuntu, and other distribution, and letting them decide what, what they want to, to try out. It's also the context that is quite, uh, quite interesting. So we are teaching also uh, version control tools, for, for instance, as part of uh, of a lot of software that is being taught in the course, but we try to provide some cultural context to it because ultimately, we don't want to make super fancy makers and designers who just make stuff for the sake of making stuff and they make it open for them for the sake of making it open. We want to use 
Flickr and Free Software as really a conceptual and technical tool to understand how technology and cultures are working today. And this is why the, the research aspect and the, the critical studies um, influence in the Pittsburgh Institute is, is very important. Some of our students are using the wiki to, to dump uh, some, some ideas for their, for their thesis. Um, and also, in terms of, of growing knowledge, uh, the, the wiki has become a place where you can find quite a lot of, uh, of information, bits of code and how-tos and tutorials that are contributed, both by the, by the staff and by, by the students on the same exact level. So the point here is basically how we can uh, connect this thing that was specific to the Pittsburgh Institute, but to also make the whole Willem de Koning Academy bachelors benefit from this, this specific approach that has been going on for uh, nearly a, a decade. Well, first of all, we've been starting to use a wiki as a first step between us to just, uh, to just work together. And, um, and this, for instance, this page is, is, a, is a resources that we've been starting to, uh, to write about how kind of, what kind of workflows we could figure out for designing lectures. And, um, uh, and this is growing slowly, and eventually the, the wiki is going to be opened up to other staff and other uh, teachers and the students of, uh, of the academy as the, the program is getting developed. The program will be launched officially in 2013, the next um, academic uh, year. But uh, in the spirit of release early and release often, we are already implementing some aspect of it in the current program. So for instance, in Amsterdam, the December 2013, there are going to be uh, an event on the topic of uh, free culture. And uh, the, the current bachelor graphics students of the William de Koning Academy are working on this event where they are being asked to develop an identity for, for this event, to think about the, how to, to, to develop the communication strategies. And this is going to be done at several levels, including how to use uh, free software to, to develop this, uh, this visual and this, this communication, and how to uh, map free, free culture and communicate it to, to a broader audience. Uh, if we start to zoom in into the, um, the new curriculum that will start uh, next academic year, we have uh, isolated three elements, uh, which is open design, data design, and digital craft. The way it's going to work, very briefly, uh, is this, when the students are going to come in their first year of a four years um, bachelor education, they're going to choose a certain type of, uh, of practice, uh, for instance, gra graphic design, and then, uh, year after year, they're going to get increasingly specialized in a, in a specific domain. So for instance, someone who, is into, who decides to be um, a fashion, fashion designer would, could get a specialization in open design. A graphic design student could get uh, a specialization in, in data design. So this is going to be extremely uh, important. And the last year of the bachelor's is really going to develop a project specific to these specializations. Five minutes, thank you. Hello, my name is Diana. I'm the coordinator of the Slippery Field uh, Open Design at the Academy. What we're trying to do is to um, investigate and explore what open design could be, could mean for, uh, for our curriculum. And we specifically focus on, um, on physical products, or product design, or even other kinds of products. And uh, as another focus point, we would like to uh, pay more attention to the whole idea of, of design sharing, um, uh, sharing products, and, and sharing also uh, processes uh, online, of course, in order to uh, let users make them relevant for themselves. And uh, another topic we're focusing on is digital uh, fabrication. Um, of course, open design, as I said, is a slippery field and it also raises uh, a few questions based on, for art education, for the William de Koning, two uh, important, uh, well, paradigms actually. One is, of course, uh, ownership. And within that field, we are collaborating, we have a collaboration with uh, Creative Commons, the Netherlands, and we are sort of like co-developing specific scenarios for uh, for, for designers, of what, what, how could they apply uh, Creative Commons licenses and, and, and how and why. Um, another, and that is of course for us the most important uh, 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 question is, uh, concerns authorship and then specifically artistic authorship. Uh, 
does there exist anything like open authorship or how could it be applied to our program? So to be a bit more concrete, um, uh, some educational goals of our, our program include exploring the aesthetics and poetics of open design uh, for the field of designing and art. The other one includes um, investigating, analyzing, and working with uh, more or new or older method approaches uh, of open design. And um, of course, what it means to share design uh, and your design knowledge and your products. And on a more pragmatic level, uh, working with digital fabrication. Ah. So quickly, I'll explain to you one example of uh, our, our uh, program as of next year. Um, one product is called Opening Up um, the Origins of Things. And it departs from the idea, actually, that, that of course, we are all alienated uh, from products by mass industry and mass production. So the idea is that students go to the scrapyard, find products, take them apart, make them, repair them, hack them, um, make their own new parts by digital fabrication, and tell a new story about this product uh, with, with their new design, more or less. Um, the goals of what the educational goals are um, that students learn to reappropriate and personalize and make accessible and shareable uh, by, uh, by, uh, by users. And also to learn about alternative mass production means. So we will visit uh, scrapyards, uh, fab labs, hackerspaces, and also uh, traditional conventional factories. Um, yeah, some possible outcomes we expect, we hope to expect are, um, well, maybe a personal improvements of the product, a Frankenstein fridge, for instance, or even a data visualization of the origins of this product that has been made new. Hi, everyone. My name is Alte van Meer. I'm coordinator of CrossLab within the Willem de Koning, which uh, yeah, um, uh, is busy with uh, education around digital media for years now, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about two other um, yeah, programs we are developing. One of them is data design, and um, so I'm going to be really short because we're short, <laughs> we're cutting, we don't have enough time, but uh, data design is... Um, uh, Data are everywhere now and becoming the material for design, actually. Within this program, we want to, uh, we want to focus on how to design for dynamic data. So the, the amount of data explodes and continuously mobile media uh, collect, uh, uh, collect our data. So mobile phones with software logs, uh, cameras, microphones, RFID, tags, wireless networks, social networks, etc. In addition to our own social uh, data and the data which is generated by, by the media and everyone else, uh, governments and local authorities are also opening up their data. So I'm refer referring here to open data. So you could say we live in a data-dense world. So we think there is a need now for designers who can shape and give meaning to this endless flow of data. And so numbers, stats and figures tell us little. But when you see them visualized uh, in an attractive and compelling way, uh, the data comes alive and starts making sense to us. So data design focus on finding meaning and stories in large amounts of data, and then translating these stories into a meaningful visual or experience which, which communicates to an audience. So um, yeah, we go to <laughs> digital crafts. <laughs> Um, so this is another learning trajectory within the uh, Willem de Koning. And I would, uh, uh, so digital craft is about crafts and about new tools and technologies. Uh, new technologies such as 3D printing or laser cutting have changed craft and design. Uh, but especially the process of making has changed. So we make things different now. So digital craft is about change and how we shape our tools. In an era where digital production technologies are commonplace, the craftsman is now often romanticized and is seen as a person who works in a workshop with wood and metal. However, the relationship between technology and craft has always been there. And uh, so the pencil, pen, the kill, and the loom sit alongside the computer. 
the laser cutter and the 3D printer. So all belong to a list of media technologies, which were all at one point considered new. So craft relies on one skill to leverage these tools in order to push and form a material. And next to that, it implies that one can take ownership or master their own work process. So digital crafts is concerned with the appropriation of digital media technologies. And appropriation is about learning the tools and retooling them. So retooling means to adapt, alter, and make them more suitable to their specific use and making pro uh, progress. I know I have to quit, which is really a pity because I wanted to actually uh, uh, tell a bit of more examples we are actually developing within the education. Uh, but so when you're interested, maybe you should come to our uh, workshop mm -hmm. and then we can tell a bit more about the program we're actually developing and becomes a bit more concrete. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to wrap up in one half minute. So, <laughs> so basically, we... Um, there is this what has been presented by Alti and Dina, but there is a core, a core aspect also to all these schools, which is around the, free culture, the ideas of free culture, authorship, web, digital literacy, and participation, which all comes with strings attached, but that's, that's the point of uh, trying to, to engage the students uh, with them. And we're not going to do that alone. It's getting harder and harder to read, that's the point. We have a, a, we built a sort of a network of partners which is, which is growing, so we can do this not just in-house but with other people. Um, yeah, so Creative Commons in the Netherlands was, was mentioned, but we also have Rhizome for data design. And uh, one that is quite important is, is Mozilla, because Mozilla is going, uh, which is going to be the first time the Webmakers Project is going to be partner of, uh, of the course, and they're going to give us feedback on the curriculum. We're going to use the Webmakers uh, tool, and that also means that our course uh, will be under a free culture license. So we're going to have a mix of GPL, CC by SA, and CC0 for everything that is going to be produced within, uh, within the course and will be put online on, on the wiki. So in the end, something that is quite important for us is that, uh, okay, it, sounds, it looks like a, like, like a mess and very focused on the academy, but, but in fact, whoop, we just want to be some sort of a node. And it's, you want to see it again? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. <So. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, years of training. So, um, <laughs> so that's the point. The, to be a node, so, so node implies that there is a network, and that's why we're trying to do this, this sort of meeting at 2:30 ish. Um, today really to try to build towards a network of free culture aware educators in art and design and really figure out if there is really a here enough people and willing to try to, to do this, this, uh, this, this thing together so we can be part of, of a broader uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>